As a Star Trek fan and really a fanatic, if I'm being honest, I still well up with optimism whenever I hear that opening phrase, space, the final frontier. It has been my dream to travel into space and boldly go where no one, or at least we, have never gone before. That we will follow our natural urge for exploration and advance to becoming a multi-planetary species within my lifetime. But I realize it's not all about my personal aspirations. Being a little more altruistic, I firmly believe that humanity becoming a multi-planet species will be absolutely necessary to ensure our long-term survival, given the possibility of catastrophic events we face here on our home planet. But regardless of the reason we choose to slip these surly bonds of Earth, tens of thousands of people will be needed to establish a self-sustaining colony on another planet. Anthropologist Cameron Smith from Portland State University believes this group size is necessary to provide the genetic as well as demographic diversity required to give the settlement its best chance of survival. Nonetheless, we have made little material progress since we landed our first astronauts on the moon in 1969. Over the last 60 years, we, with we being the entire world, have only managed to place 553 individuals into Earth orbit. That's an average of about 10 astronauts per year. We've only sent 24 beyond low Earth orbit. So given this disparity between what we have done and what we need to achieve, it stands to reason that our approach to human spaceflight may be wrong. But let's take a moment and consider the current reality of the spaceflight environment and our path forward. Imagine it is the year 2035. NASA has spent the last decade or so establishing the Lunar Gateway. It's a research platform orbiting the moon that can be used as a launch point for missions into deep space. From here, you could depart on a mission to Mars, or perhaps Ceres in the asteroid belt. After your massive transfer vehicle has fired its rockets, you'd be sent hurtling away from the Earth and the Moon at about 30,000 miles per hour. Now, very quickly after this point, there's no ability to turn around and come home. There's no room for regret. There's no ability to uh, receive additional supplies, so don't forget anything. You've become fully committed to a thousand days or more in deep space. Now, fortunately, you've got everything you need packed away in your habitat here. You have thousands of pounds of food, hundreds of gallons of water, clothing, personal items, emergency medical supplies, space suits, spare parts. Look like a great place to spend a few years, right? So on top of those less than ideal living conditions, you'll get to spend the next, uh, the next couple of years going through all the detrimental impacts that spaceflight has on the human body. You'll get to experience things such as muscle atrophy from disuse, bone loss, nausea, and formation of kidney stones from all the calcium that's now pouring out of your bones without the constant stress and loading that your skeleton will experience every day from gravity here on Earth. You'll get to spend two or three hours every day hooked up to some fairly ridiculous exercise contraptions just to try and mitigate those effects. Now, with all that going on, Imagine you're now crammed in this environment with a hundred or so other individuals all undergoing this same experience and all equally as miserable. The real issue is that with our current systems and technologies, we can't really build the spacecraft to do this. We can't send the right crew sizes necessary to initiate a colonization effort, let alone do it affordably and sustainably. But I believe we have an opportunity to change all of this and change it now. The solution has been teasing us in almost every good and bad science fiction movie you've probably seen, and there's been a lot of bad. There is a medical practice in use today called therapeutic hypothermia. It places individuals suffering from stroke, cardiac arrest, and traumatic brain injury into an inactive sleep-like state using sedation and a reduction in their core body temperature. This gives the patient time to recover 
and prevents oxygen damage at a time the body may be struggling to provide that damage. It is typically administered for periods of two or three days at a time, and it's been performed in hospitals all over the world. Now we can and should leverage this knowledge and procedure. We can extend the time periods for which it's administered from days to perhaps weeks, possibly even months, adapt, make some adaptations for space flight, and apply it to the crew and passengers during the transit phases of these long duration missions. With only a small reduction in the core body temperature, the metabolism of, the hum of humans can be significantly lowered. A 10 degree change from your nominal 98.6 degree condition can lower your metabolism by 50 to 70% and place you in this inactive state. In this inactive state, we have less energy requirements, uh, therefore we can lower your food and oxygen demands. We'll also have you confined to a much smaller space so we can eliminate a lot of systems and equipment that we no longer need, making the spacecraft a lot smaller and therefore lighter. Now I fully expect that the ultimate implementation of this will be different than the current procedures and protocols for therapeutic hypothermia, but this serves as an excellent proof of concept and gives us confidence that we can apply this in the near term for space flight. So we don't have all the answers yet, and there's certainly a lot of uh, challenges still, but these guys can actually help. We can take inspiration and knowledge from a number of animal species that are already experts at surviving during times of limited resources, such as the bear, the Arctic ground squirrel, and the fat-tailed dwarf lemur that all enter annual hibernation periods. We can create new pharmaceuticals inspired from these animals that can regulate the thermogenic process in our body that controls heat generation. See, as your body is cooled, your muscles have an automatic reflex to shiver to warm yourself back up. With these new pharmaceuticals, we, we can suppress that, that reflex, minimize the amount of sedation that's necessary during this process, and then extend, extend the time periods. So while humans can't actually hibernate, we can mimic hibernation and induce this state artificially. If we explore these impacts more from a medical perspective, lowering the metabolism and cooling is likely to reduce those challenging rates of muscle atrophy and bone loss that we often experience on prolonged space flight. Astronauts also suffer from vision changes and impairment in space. This is due to an increase in intracranial pressure that occurs inside the head. It's a swelling that's not attributed to an ego boost because you're an astronaut now, but body fluid shifts in microgravity. Fortunately, cooling, body cooling is already known to reduce brain swelling here on Earth and should be beneficial for the astronauts in space. We also have uh, challenges with galactic cosmic radiation. So this is a major health risk for the crew and, and is their, uh, NASA's number one risk item on their human research program. So these are high energy particles constantly moving through space that impact the central nervous system and increase our long-term risk for cancer by destroying our cells and our DNA. On an exciting note, there's some promising research that indicates that this uh, body cooling uh, potentially has a radiation protective effect at the cellular level. So we can avoid extensive shielding on the spacecraft. Now, when we place, uh, pull all these things together, we can completely rethink the way that we are designing these missions for space flight and trying to get us to our destination. With an inactive crew, we can reduce the uh, spacecraft size, lowering the power and volume requirements, we have lower food allocations, as well as water and oxygen demand. We can introduce innovative engineering solutions, such as we can place that radiation shielding directly around the inactive crew instead of around the entire spacecraft. And we can provide new medical solutions to increase the overall health and well-being for the astronauts, improving their phys physiological condition during the mission. It's time that we rethink our vision for human spaceflight, that we begin to enable it for the masses and make human colonies on other planets a reality. This technology 
can help us achieve that, then we can finally truly explore that final frontier. Thank you.